Good evening again. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It's just another day that the Lord has kept us. And I don't know about you, I'm mighty glad to be here on today. Reverend Mason, before we start, I want to take a moment and pray for the situation where last I checked and saw 14 children lost their lives. One school teacher and the person that perpetrated the crime lost their life also. So what we want to do is take a moment and go to God in prayer for them. And then we will come back and go in start what we're going to do for today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this awesome opportunity just to call on your holy and precious name. God, we don't come asking for anything for ourselves except that you forgive us of any and all of our sins, dear God. But God, right now, in the name of Jesus, yes. God, we come praying for the families, dear God, of those who have lost their lives, God. God, for whatever reason, someone decided to go into a school and start shooting, dear God, and now lives that were here are no longer here. <clears throat> now families that sent their children to school this morning and expecting to see them won't get to see them again, dear God. God, we don't know why the young man did what he did. But God, we just pray you have mercy on his soul as well. It is my understanding that he lost his life also. So God, for the teacher that lost her life or his life, God, we pray that their soul was right with you. For the children, dear God, that lost their lives, we pray for mercy, dear God. This close to the end of the school year, God, and these children's lives have been taken away. God, we pray for the families, dear God, whose lives right now are shook. We pray for the families, dear God, who don't understand why we Pray for that grieving mother, that grieving father, dear God, that grandmother that was perhaps taking care of a child. God, we just pray for them right now in the name of Jesus. And God, this makes what we're getting ready to do tonight all the more necessary. The conversation we're about to continue in, dear God. Lord, have mercy is very needed right now, dear God. So God, that what you do, do it like you've done it before. We pray for your arms of comfort right now around these families. It's in Jesus' name we ask and we thank you. Amen. 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 <clears throat> um, Good afternoon to all of you who are listening. Whether you're joining by, yeah, this side. Whether you're joining by conference call line or whether you're watching us on Facebook Live. Oh God, Lord have mercy. 
I was almost at my destination to where we do the podcast to where I am right now at Reverend Mason's house and an alert came across my phone and when I opened it it said 14 children and one teacher killed in a school shooting in Texas and the the person who perpetrated the crime they're dead also. Give me a moment. I gotta get myself together for this one. Because I started thinking about the kids at the school where I work at. How that could have been those children. And we just buried recently two youth in our county over the past three to four weeks. But here are 14 lives, 16 total lives taken out in a matter of whatever time period. I don't know all the logistics. I don't know whether it was an elementary school. I don't know whether it was middle school, kindergarten, or what. But I do know that 14 children are dead. I don't care who you are, that ought to bother me. That 14 children have lost their lives through no fault of their own, through nothing that they've done. 14 kids are now dead. If ever there was a time that we need you, that time is right now. Um, Lord, help me see that. I, I don't understand it. And I know everything is not meant for me to understand, but that right there gets me very nice. Um, Lord, have mercy. Again, thank you for joining us on tonight. We are the ministry of For Such a Time as This. He is Reverend John S. Mason. I'm Reverend G. Lewis Tillman. In a few minutes, we'll be joined by our other colleague, Brother Sam Miller, Jr. And we're going to go ahead on and continue with this series we've been working on out of Luke 14, no I'm sorry, Luke 16, verses 19 through 21, 31. You guys please bear with me tonight, my soul is disturbed, I'm disturbed. I, I love children, I work with them and to see them excuse me, kids' lives needlessly taken away like that. It bothers me more than I can express to you. So, we're going to ask Reverend Mason if he would give us a word of prayer and then we'll jump into Luke Sixteen. As a matter of fact, I'll go ahead and pray. You want to get the door, and uh, we'll, we'll jump into this thing. Let's pray, Father. We thank you for another wonderful opportunity to come together and share another word on tonight. God, we lift your name on high. We bless you. We say thank you for this group of men who this group of men who come together every Tuesday and one of them is walking in right now so please forgive us but we thank you dear God for this ministry that you've given us we thank you for the time that we're getting ready to spend together 
And God, we thank you for this word that we're going to continue on with on tonight. God, you put this in our spirit some time ago, and we've been trying to be obedient to your word, your will, and to your way. And so, God, tonight, bless us, keep us, be with us. You get the glory, dear God, out of what we are getting ready to do and to say. And so, God, on tonight, for those that will listen, God, we pray that your spirit would disturb them heavily, God. We pray, dear God, in the name of Jesus, that you would, dear God, just have your way. Speak a word to us like you always do, dear God. Get the glory out of our lives. Get the glory out of this ministry. It's in Jesus' name we ask. And God, we thank you. Amen. Amen. And amen. We apologize for the inconvenience right now. We're making room for our brother, Brother Sam, to come on in and join the conversation. And so on tonight, we want to continue what we've been doing. Let's see, my brother. We want to continue this conversation that we've been having on Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. Um, we've been talking about hell, don't go there. And a lot of people who are talking about heaven ain't going to make it easy. A lot of people who profess to be on their way to heaven, I hate to say this, but one day you're going to lift up your eyes and a devil's going to hell. Oh, Lord. On the last conversation that we had, we were talking about Reverend Mason and what's that? Come on around a little bit so you can get in on this time. We were talking about um, how there are some people that are so busy and so distracted that They really don't have time for God. Talking about how some people with their riches, all they have time for is obtaining more riches. We're talking about how some people who, some preachers, they don't preach like the old preachers used to preach no more. Back in the days, the older preachers preached those hot sermons, what we call hellfire and brimstone. And now, you listen to preachers preach, it's so often that the name of Christ is not even mentioned. They're talking about getting your blessings and this anointing that God has got on your life and the favor that God has on your life and talking about your haters and the Bible says preach Christ and him crucified. And while that entails a lot, Revelation, Christ still needs to be the central thing. And there is a place that Christ mentions in the Bible that people don't believe in. Come on around, bro. We're good. There's a place in the Bible that folks say, 
I don't believe God will send me. You know, since he's so good, how can a good God send people to hell? That's what they say. But we've discussed it. That God does not send anybody to hell. You know, Timothy, God will give you the choice. Y'all don't know how good I feel, even though I feel bad right now. Because we three strong right now. God will give you a choice to accept his son or turn your back on his son. He just that good. In our story that we've been dealing with these past two weeks, story of two men with two different lifestyles. We talked about it up until where he talked about that gulf being fixed in the middle. And just for clarification, and I know it's a few verses, but let me go ahead and read these verses so people will get a good understanding of what we're talking about. Verse 19 in Luke 16, and, and the thing that gets me, young Timothy, is this is in a red. Every time you see something in red in the Bible, it's my understanding that Jesus is coming. These are his words. Now, all the Bible is his word, but it's his word that has been dispersed through me. But these are his words right here. But in Luke 16, verse 19 through 31, it says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of souls, and desiring to be fed of the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his souls. And it came to pass, Lord have mercy, that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he, the rich man, cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thou good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is this great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto him, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophet. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now, up until this, we've covered so much. And if you haven't um, heard the previous stuff, or the previous episodes, rather, you can go back and check it on any of the podcast um, platforms that we're on or on Facebook Live, and the videos are up there, and also on our YouTube channel. But uh, we want to zoom in to verse 27 right now, because we've covered up until here. We've covered how this rich man had it going on and he didn't do what he could have did for a beggar. We covered how when it says the beggar just wanted the crumbs from the rich man's table. They didn't use napkins back then. They would use bread. And so the rich man would clean his hands with the bread and the crumbs that fell from the bread of him cleaning his hands. That's what the beggar wanted. We also covered that everybody it's got an appointment with them. Hebrews 9, 27. Job 14 and 1 tell us we're going to die. 
man that is born of a woman is but a few days and full of trouble. Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Death ain't all, y'all. Mm. Death ain't all. And so we get to this conversation and he's in hell and he's tormented. And remember, Mason, you said you wanted to kick something. The brother said, we're going to open the floor to you. You said you wanted to kick up on something about that torment. And if you want to go ahead and do that, we'll, we'll give Brother Sam the floor after that, and then we'll go ahead on and get into this thing. Because, see, now he's gotten to the point where he's concerned about his family. He realizes his faith cannot change. He's stuck. He's dead. Ain't nothing he can do different. Hell is one way in, no way out. Now, for everybody that will listen to this, if you can hear this, you're not in that position that he is in. You still have the opportunity to make the right decision. Red Mason, if you want to hit on that torment right quick, and we'll give Brother Sam some, some room, and then we'll jump into this, because now he's concerned about his family. And, and that precisely would be one of his torments right there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a torment, a conscious torment of the mind. Uh, just imagine that you're in this place and you're suffering already through all the different torments that are happening to you. And he begins to think about his family members, where he loves them and He's thinking about how he's suffering right now, and he don't want them to come to this place. See, that's that's one of the things that we need as as Christians, and and, and it seems like uh, for some of us, and I I have to say some of us uh, because it's not all of us, but it is some of us. Uh, we we seem to have to get a taste of something first mm. before we understand the reality of it. Wow. Uh, and I know none of us want a taste of hell uh, to see or realize the reality of that, but sometimes when you, you get burnt, you know, by fire or you get burnt by or scalded by water, uh, it sort of instantly triggers a thought process to where you think, man, you know, this, uh, something like this is so painful. Uh, it makes me think about it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes for us, the only thing that, that makes us uh, a believer or what makes us move is that sometimes we have to get a taste of something. You know, just talking about it sometimes doesn't do anything to us. But uh, getting a taste of it seems to move us, get us in motion, you know, in action. So you look at this rich man here. He's in a position now to where he's thinking uh, about his family members who are not suffering like he is right now. And so first of all, he thinks about, oh, well, let me see if I can warn them ahead of time mm -hmm. so they won't come to this place. And so... I know I can't get to him, but maybe Abraham, Father Abraham can get to him, you know. Uh, or maybe the one that I mistreated so badly, <laughs> maybe he have a, a, a heart now, a heart of compassion for me to where he can go back and warn my brothers about this place so they won't come here too. So he, he's thinking now more about other people. First of all, his family. And he still is not looking at how he mistreated Lazarus because you still haven't, now, now I noticed there's one thing you still haven't heard him say. He still haven't said, uh, Father Ham, by the way, uh, if you can get Brother Lazarus' attention, tell Brother Lazarus that I'm terribly sorry or how I mistreated him when we were both living on earth. Mm. You still don't hear a confession now that I'm sorry the way I mistreat him. Now, I mean, you don't hear that at all. And you think that you would hear that. Sure. But he's asking for a favor. He's asking for a favor right now. Now, when, I, when Lazarus was asking for the crumbs from his table, he couldn't give him the crumbs that he was throwing away. Oh, 
what we said last week. Every question you ask, the answer is no. Answer is no. You get to hell, every question you ask, the answer is no. Answer is no. You're right. And so we look at him being tormented by the conscience of his mind now. Because now he's concerned. At one time, he wasn't concerned about, I, I would say, maybe people. Because of the type of lifestyle that he lived in. And, and how he treated Lazarus, one that was so much in need. He was a beggar, in need. And he basically paid him no attention. But now he's concerned about the welfare of other people now. It's amazing how certain situations will bring certain things out of you that you never thought about at the time. <laughs> but now it makes you think about it in a different way. You know, oh, I did treat that person like that, you know, didn't. But if you still look at him, he still hasn't apologized to him. He ain't good He still has an act for forgiveness from him. I don't do you know. Is he in the state now the way he can act for forgiveness? Or he just won't do it now? He's in the state that doesn't matter he asks for it or not. It doesn't matter. But what I'm saying, even then he's in the torment, and this, this is a big part of it. Even though he's being tormented right now, he's not being tormented enough to get to that point. The way he says, forgive me. I'm tired of this. Because he still think he running stuff. But ain't, ain't it amazing to know that even though he may still think that he's running stuff, this man is being tormented in these flames, but he still hasn't thought about the wrong that he did to Lazarus. And here he's looking at Lazarus head on. Him and Lazarus are looking at each other, knowing how they treated each other or how he treated Lazarus. But he's not saying anything about, I'm sorry, and, and if, if I could change things from what I'm going through right now, if I could change things and get back in, in your grace or get back and make it right, then I would do that. But you won't hear him say it. His, self, excuse me, brother, I'm good. His selfishness caused him to be in hell, and while he's in hell, he's still selfish. It's true. That's what I'm saying. He had to change. He's he, still so, so the torment... And knowing that you are in a hopeless, helpless situation still doesn't change your mindset. So he, he, he is dealing with the torment of the mind. The way now he wants to do right. But he can't. And as you said before, every question he asks, the answer is no. So I, I was just looking at the words torments and uh, the word used here for torments, it says that it originally referred to a stone uh, used for testing gold and other metals and then came to mean uh, what we call a torture rack. Yeah. Uh, and it was used to extort prisoners. That's the type of uh, procedure they use. If they wanted to get you to confess, if they wanted to get you uh, to own up to your wrongdoings, then they would torture you to get you to confess it. And so it's a little different. In this context, uh, the word can refer only to the most extreme forms of human suffering. So we look at the rich man who's suffering now, and he asks the question of Lazarus, bring him or dipping his finger in water. And just one drop off the tip of his finger to cool, off to cool his tongue. He's saying, if I could just get just that little measure of relief, I think I would be okay. And that's what he's thinking. But see, one drop ain't going to do it. Well, one drop would have cooled off all the hell. But from that context, one drop would have had to have led to another drop to keep getting relief. Here's the thing. Ain't no relief in hell. Ain't, ain't, ain't no... Ain't, 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 I'm sorry for saying that. There's no relief once you get there. First day he said, I'm tormented in these flames. Right. And his conscious mindset wants just a drop of water. Just, just, just give me one drop. You know, if, if I don't get a whole whole bottle, if I don't get a whole gallon of water, if I can have the sensation or the satisfaction 
of one drop just cool, cool in my tongue. That's what I desire. See, that's another torment that you have the desire of knowing what water does when it comes down to cooling you right. or, or quenching your thirst. Really? You know what that means. Yeah, getting the relief from it. But he would never get it, even though he desires it. So there is going to be physical torment, mental torment, and emotional torment. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and you see in scripture here that all phases of the five senses are being tormented. There's a consciousness. There's remembrance. True. Go ahead. You kind of you kind of um, hit on for me because you just said it. Um, the selfishness there. I mean, he's still selfish. I mean, that's just it. He's still selfish just because. Number one, you think about it. He just lifted up his eyes in hell. So you haven't been tormented long enough yet. <laughs> that's, that's, that's number one because he's just now in the beginning phase of the tormenting part. Because when he lifted up his eyes, it's like you know, there's there's nothing else. Right. But now, as you said, that physical, that mental, all that, the selfishness is still there. True. That he hadn't had a time, he hadn't had a long enough time. It's kind of like every, when you get into something, and you know I'm in trouble right now, but I'm still going ahead. But as you go along, I'm really in trouble. Exactly. So he's now realizing that that I'm, I'm, I'm in some kind of trouble here, so I'm going to have to figure something out right now. Yeah. See, he's, he's trying to figure a game plan already, but there's no game plan left. That's it. You're at the truth. And, and you said the selfishness is there. He's just still thinking about self. Yeah, he's, he's definitely still thinking about self. I don't know what just hit me. It's another form of torment. There will be some families that are tormented because they don't listen to other family members. Look, he's looking at, at, at the rich, the, the beggar. That's going to be torment right there, the to see that I'm jacked up and you're okay. There could be some family members that would not listen to other family members for whatever reason, because of what they used to do, because of what they used to think, because of how they used to live, but they got their lives together. Who are you to try to tell me anything? I'm saved now. I can tell you what thus saith the Lord. Here this fella is, the Bible said that he told him, remember, in your lifetime, you had it going on. Lazarus was suffering. And as you said last week, now the tables are turned. Mm -hmm. Lazarus is resting in you torment. She was on another foot. She was on another foot. You better listen to your family member if they didn't got, I don't care what they used to do. I don't care how they used to live. If they living for the Lord now, you better listen to them. Because there's going to come a day and a time when you won't be able to listen to them if you keep turning your back on them. True. And so, there was a consciousness that you're going to have in you. There was a conviction. Go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, and then, like you said earlier, and I'm thinking about this rich man who he has all these lavish things. You know what? He was laid, or as we say, he was drugged, thrown, torn to that thing mm -hmm. for a reason. Yeah. That was his opportunity to possibly say, okay, I, I gave you this last chance to show me that you have some compassion and love for others outside of yourself mm -hmm. and all that you have to this, what I laid before you to give a hand to that might just been enough to say, okay, you lay past all that you have to take care of this this man that's full of sores and, and starving exactly. to take care of him, but you still did. It's kind of like what me and I look at, man, but everybody don't get that time after time after time, the opportunity and opportunity to say, okay, Lord, that you still not know with me. He just didn't get it. Right. But that could have been his moment that's true. to show God that he has some love and compassion outside of himself. He could have stood before God and said, you know what? You've done the right thing. This is exactly what you're supposed to have done at this very moment. True. 
you have no grace. But now the grace is good because you it, it, it's, it's yeah. just that moment could have been his moment. That's true. It's true. He turned his back on the <clears throat> grace. And we're going to do a um, series on money somewhere upcoming. His money had his mind. Because the Bible said that this man fared sumptuously every day. He was clothed in purple and fine linen. And we, we found out that the purple that he was clothed in, watch this, was exported to where he lived. He had it going on. And that's for people that's going to have it going on on this side. But once you close your eyes for the last time on this side, if you did not have a relationship with Jesus, if you have not been guilty of Romans 10 and 9, mm -hmm. if thou wilt believe in thy heart and confess with thy mouth that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, and for with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. I might have just twisted that up, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> if you don't put your faith in Jesus Christ, I'm just going to be real. You're going to bust hell wide open. One day, you're going to close your eyes, and you're going to do like this beggar did. You're going to lift up your eyes in hell. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a um, you gonna lift up your eyes and hell. Yeah, go ahead, sir. I say to me, it's a I could have been there. You know, I mean, all of any of us could have been there oh, at some yeah. point in time. You know, as I you know think of myself with all the opportunities that you know that man, God could have just been a case. Let's go ahead. And I know that, you know, I wasn't right. But we have, you know, sometimes when you go through things, you get a little bit of understanding of, okay, it's not all about me. It's not just me. There has to be something else, you know, right. that, that's taking place outside of the behaviors and actions that I'm doing. So, but it's a lot of times that people think that, you know, this isn't, they don't really believe in God. You know, in a sense, and that, that belief and that faith isn't as strong as it is. But I'm glad we're having this conversation because people just need to understand and know that it is. So, and and the preaching that you're saying that you discussed, and I heard it earlier, Professor, before we, you know, before I stepped in, that you know people need to have that understanding, of, you know, of hell and, and, and the things that come along with it, because it is, it truly is. I'm, I'm thankful for it. Uh, I agree. I agree. I, 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 I was listening and I was hearing some similarities here uh, of the rich man's state or his faith now. Uh, and, and I relate that to Revelation 22 uh, where I think it's verse 11 and uh, I've, I've got it here. But I, I see where his, his state is fixed. It's unchangeable. Right. Uh, the way he died is the way he is. That's where he winded up in hell, that, in that same state. Same state of mind. Same physical body, capacity, everything. He, he's still that same person. And so... Uh, you see him in his speech to uh, Father Abraham trying to change now to be that good person or that good Samaritan type person that, uh, which has to come from a, a changed heart and that's where he, he's trying to uh, care about his brothers and even asking Lazarus to do him a favor now when he did Lazarus no favors on earth.
but he's he's trying to change. And, and, and what I'm looking at, when I say I see the similarities is, I see that his state is fixed. Right. Where he's unchangeable, right? There you go. All right. But what I look at, too, is that how quickly death is. Death gives you uh, basically no warning about when it's your time. You know, it's, it's going to be like swift and quick. You're dead. And if you don't know Christ as Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, then it's going to be in hell that you lift up your eyes. But what I was looking at in the similarity there, I was looking at Revelation 22 and verse 11, when it talks about uh, the quickness of when Jesus comes back. Uh, he says Christ is to come quickly. You know, start with verse 6 there in Revelation 22, uh, chapter 22. But he gets to <coughs> verse 11 there, and he says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. You won't have time <laughs> if you won't get it right now. You're not going to have time to get it right in hell when you're lifting up your eyes. I said it again, and I said it again. Biggest prayer meeting. The biggest prayer meeting. Let me, let, me, let me back up. The smallest prayer meeting that's going on is going on on Wednesday nights. Okay, gotcha. The smallest prayer meeting okay. is going on on Wednesday night at church. All right. You can ride by churches. And you can count the people that's there at the church on your fingers. That's the smallest prayer meeting that's going on right now. But the biggest prayer meeting that's going on right now is prayer meeting that's going on in hell. Because now you're hearing people pray like they never... They, they're praying like they never prayed before, man. I think... Because now there's begging going on. There's people wishing that they can change things that they never should have done. But it's too late now. What do you say? When the grave cries. Yeah. When, when the, the grave cries, cry, nobody answers. I, I preached that message one time. When the grave cries, no one answers. Because no matter how much you cry and beg for mercy and all, the answer still will be no. There's, there's no repentance beyond the grave. Right. And here is the thing again. Every request, the answer is no. Yeah. You told Jesus no on earth, he can definitely tell you no in hell. It's true. And, and you can't gamble with your soul like that. Because you don't only people that's gonna understand the reality of what we're saying right now is the ones that who didn't do it are the ones who didn't accept Christ. Because now, see, reality has, I could tell reality has a way of, of, of persuading you or convincing you. I could tell you right now that I'm going to slap you. Mm -hmm. But the only way you feel the real effects of the slap is if, is if I go ahead and slap you. The people that are in hell right now didn't believe they were gonna be in hell. That they were gonna be in hell. Well, Until okay. now, since they're in hell. <laughs> now they're in there, but there's too late, they can't get out. Yeah. But even at the same time, people who you would think or you know should go to heaven not gonna make it. Those that are in hell that you see in heaven that should, you know, thinking that they should be in hell. I mean it's, he said, you know, the righteously scarcely make it. So what about the sinner? So we, 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 we can still go through the whole, you know, because not to step on any toes or anything, but you have to understand that you being led in the wrong way. So you have to know this word. And that's why I'm glad we have the teaching and the preaching that goes on here as well. You have to understand and know this word because it's written. This God word is true. But then, then I hear the argument sometimes of saying, you know, hey, this, this, this book was, you know, it's been changed so much. Yeah. You know, white man has changed it this way, or the social and such has changed it this way. Right. Look, man, this is God's word. And 
because I'm, it's always going to remain the same. Exactly. So now you're going to be standing there going through what this is what your word didn't say that. You, you, this is my word. But you still having that whole heartly, you know, trying to make a plea and deal because, but this is my word. You didn't understand my word. You have to rightfully divide the word. But what were you doing to get a better understanding of the word? Then? If you say it was wrong, then what, what was wrong with it? What's right with it then? Do you even know? You want to know what's wrong with the word of God? Nothing. But what's wrong with it is that it makes people have to say no to themselves. People like doing what people want to do. Yes. But there is a cost to doing what you want to do. It's called reaping what you sow. People want to live in ungodly ways and still go to heaven. They want a wife and a and some of them want a wife and a girlfriend now. It used to be a wife and a side dude, but now it's a wife and a girlfriend. <laughs> or some men want a wife and a girlfriend. Now some men got a man on the side. True. People want to do what people want to do. But when it comes to the word of God, it's not your way. God's word is not Burger King. You can't have it your way. You adjust to God's word. And I'm like this right here. If giving up Tillman means I stay out of hell, bye-bye old Tillman. But then I have to understand it's a process too. It is every day. To, to, the, to the end it's going to be a process. Thank you. Okay. And to every day it is. I tell people, or I say this, that people who talk about Christians and call us hypocrites, y'all bigger hypocrites than we are. They look at me like I'm crazy. Is that what you mean? I'm like, you telling me that because I call myself a Christian, that I'm supposed to follow this book called the Word of God. Now, if you telling me that I'm supposed to follow this book, what the book say, then you must believe that that book is true. Otherwise, you telling me to go do wrong. And if you believe that the book is true because you're telling me I'm supposed to follow it, then why are you not doing it? And that makes you a bigger hypocrite than me. Yeah, because it's him that knows to do good. And do it not. <laughs> to him it is what? Sin. See, you understand that. It's amazing how God made that, that you don't even have to be spiritual to understand that right there. You know right from wrong. Exactly. And, and Romans 1 tells him, you got a conscience. But this man right now, he's concerned about his family. Yeah. He's concerned about his brothers. Why is he concerned now? Because he just died. And he know they spending his fortune. <laughs> <laughs> he know the life he lived in front of them. He didn't left them money to continue that life. And he understands now that if I put money as my master, hell will be my eternal home. If I put anything before God, hell will be my eternal home. And so now, since his brothers have access to what he had, he know their faith. He, he, he know that they seen how he lived. Seen how he dressed. You said it out there. Come down out of hell like ain't nothing. He knows that if they, now they got a hope, they probably fussing and fighting over it, unless he left a will. Unless he divided it. And see, watch this. He didn't ask for mercy earlier. Let me, yeah. find, let me find that verse. Where he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Yes. I'm going to show you something right quick. Uh, verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now he asked for mercy, but watch this. Now he asked him for grace. Want to know why? Because he said, I got five brothers. Five is the number of grace. He said, give them what they don't deserve. He's concerned now about his family. 
But as we said a few minutes ago, he had to get to the place of no return before he could become concerned about his family. He's guilty of that song that they used to sing, Don't Let It Be Said, Everlasting to Me. If I should die and my soul be lost, nobody's fault but mine. People run around thinking they're going to live forever. You are. Somewhere. Oh, yeah, you have that right. You're going to live forever somewhere. People are like, man, I can do what I want to do. It's my life. Those are the people that don't spend no time in the Word of God. True. Because the Word of God will tell you in Psalm 24 and 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. You, your house, your car, your job, your children, your money, all that stuff belong to God. And as you and I talk about, you're just a steward. So, just a manager. Just, you're just managing right now. True. You own nothing. You came in with nothing. Job said, naked came I Naked shall I return. It's true. Ain't gonna be no hearse behind your U-Haul. Exactly. And even if it was, your family would go bed, bed dig up whatever was buried. <laughs> true. Hell is real. People need to understand it. And see, Mason, they heard your voice, but they didn't see your face a few moments ago, that thing got emotional to you. And see, here's the thing. Even with what happened today, the first time you heard about the shooting in town. Yes, sir. 14 kids, one adult, and the person that perpetrated the crime. If the adult did not have it right with Christ, when they died in hell, they looked up there. You, you can't take that chance today. If, if we were to say anything uh, out of our listen today, uh, the number one thing would be is don't gamble with your soul. And I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Uh, we left off last week, Brother Sam, uh, with our ending comments. And my only comment was, uh, you had to ask yourself, is it worth it? See, when, when you evaluate and you, you look at what God has to offer us by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, and everything that he has promised us, you know, everything that he has for us, you know, we, we're part of the body of Christ now, and uh, we, we look to go to heaven and, and live in one of those dwelling places, as people call them mansions, mm -hmm. that's not built by the hands of men. Uh, and, and with everything that we're going to inherit, you know, uh, we always quote the scripture, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, you've been faithful with few things. I make you rule over much or rule over many. I, we, we looking at all of those things that are promised to us. And we don't even know the half of how good it's going to be for us when we get there. Right. But you have to weigh the difference. Is it, am I willing to take a chance on forfeiting all of that for uh, sacrificing my soul or giving my soul because uh, he said what's your profit you, you have to think we're looking at profit and, and I like how he uses that word what shall it profit a man right if he gains the whole world but he dies and lose his soul mm -hmm. 